And if I just begin by just explaining who the images uh, represent, the, the person on the left is a man called A.A. Purcell, as you can see, it's an election address from before the First World War in Salford. Um, and um, the material that I'm going to be t uh, drawing upon um, in the talk today uh, derives from this book I wrote about A.A. Uh, a. Purcell, who amongst his other activities, which is how I think Ian um, passed across with Ian, was that he was uh, an MP for the Forest of Dean in the late 1920s, amongst a whole range of other activities. So the book is, is, um, is, is on Purcell and, and s sort of explores different facets of his very um, varied life within the labour movement. In a way, the hero um, of the story I'm going to talk about today is actually the man on the right, who is a man called Fred Bramley. Um, um, and it, he's somebody that I only really came across through doing the work on Purcell. I mean, I knew of his name because he was the uh, secretary of the TUC before he died prematurely in 1925. But he's quite an obscure uh, figure, really, in terms of labour movement history. Um, and um, they, they were both, as I'll explain in, in a moment, they were both members of the same relatively small trade union, which was the National Amalgamated Furnishing Trades Association. And the, what struck me about Bramley in particular, but also Purcell, was this strong vein of internationalism running th uh, throughout their, their, their political lives and um, that took the form of a very strong um, anti-war position of the furnishing trades during the First World War. So in a sense, that's what I'm, um, you know, that's going to be the, the, the key theme of what I'm talking about today. And it's Bramley in particular who expresses that during the First World War, more so than Purcell. I'll just start off um, with a quotation from March 1915. So this is right at, in, the, in the early period of the war, actually quite a difficult period in terms of trying to express um, an anti-war position. But the quote, nevertheless, I'll just, uh, just read from it. Our rulers have quarrelled. They, without our consent, without our knowledge, but by their financial, diplomatic, military and political operations, led the workers of Europe into the bloodiest struggle that ever afflicted humanity. Today, millions of trade unionists face each other on the battlefield, armed to the teeth with the most hellish instruments of destruction human ingenuity can devise. It's not with us a question at present whether the rulers of our own country or the rulers of another are most to blame. We've no quarrel. We have no conflicting interests as workers with the workers of any country of such a nature as would in any way justify or prove the necessity of the reckless slaughter now going on. Now, for, you know, it is possible, of course, to find other quotations like that in the left press. But what I think is interesting about it, and in a way unusual about it, is that it comes from a trade union journal, the journal of this union I've just mentioned, the Furnishing Trades, and it's a manifesto drafted by two trade union officials, one of whom is Bramley, the other whom is a man called Alex Gossip, the secretary of the union. Um, it's drafted as a manifesto, which they then present to the membership of that union, um, and because of the nature of the union, it doesn't have annual conferences, it, um, it decides big decisions um, by a membership ballot. And by a majority vote, the membership ballots, they vote, so that becomes the official position of that trade union. Um, and that's, what's, um, that's what I think relatively unusual about it, because if we think about the opposition to the First World War, as I'm sure the other things you've been discussing in this programme of events, um, we think of various, the sort of leftist groups, some of which, or many of which, feed into the early Communist Party the sorts of things that people like Ken Weller um, have looked at. We think of like liberal internationalists, the Union of Democratic Control, some of those liberal internationalists who, through the experience of the First World War, make their way into the Labour Party. And you can find them on the, on the, uh, in, as parliamentarians within the Labour Party in the 1920s. Equally, you can think of things like the gender perspective, things like the Women's International League and the Women's Crusade, movements which during the war expressed a clear anti-war position. 
but we don't tend to think of trade unionists or at least trade you know trade unions as a body and trade union officers are playing much role within it usually the trade unions are seen as having been sucked into the war machine or at best defending their members interests within the unchallenged framework of the war so they do continue to pursue traditional trade union objectives but they don't express that type of anti-war position I've just mentioned um, I want to cite a whole number of examples of um, of writings like that actually they don't just focus on the on the on the first world war people like this for example Stephen Howe is a historian who wrote a very good book on anti-colonialism and the British left but um, but he's dealing mostly with various left groups his, his view of the TUC the trade union congress um, and the trade union movement is almost totally parochial that they don't um, think out to these bigger issues um, and it's also true I'm going to talk about this this furnishing trade union um, today it's also true that um, that NAFTA, the furnishing trades, it isn't a typical union in the sense that I would say it's probably the most consistently internationalist trade union there is in Britain. The position expressed within that manifesto, it maintains throughout the war. It's General Secretary Alex Gossip, you know, um, August, September, October, November 1914, he writes his monthly notes in the Union Journal and they consistently denounce the war. We as workers have no interest in this. Um, NAFTA, is the, as it proudly boasts after the war, is the one trade union in Britain that boasts of maintaining continuous contact with its German counterpart throughout the war. And on all the issues that come up um, during the war, you know, mi uh, military conscription, industrial conscription, the incorporation of the unions into the sort of war machine, um, through the Treasury Agreement, it takes a position of opposing those. As I, as I mentioned, um, in a moment, it's got a, it's got a very ethnically mixed membership. And it takes a very strong line, officially, not all of its members, a very strong line against the discrimination against or persecution of the Austrian, Hungarian and German members of the Union. Um, and so, that, as I say, there's this, it's, you know, that, that's an unusual position for a trade union to take. Um, Fred Brantley, uh, who, who uh, he, he adopts his position throughout the war, at the end of the war, in the Kharki election, which is a very difficult election in some ways for anti-war socialists to fight, he not only stands on his record, um, but he does so in the constituency of Plymouth Devonport, naval constituency, almost the difficult, most difficult terrain you could imagine, where of course he's denounced by his opponents as a pro-German and, and, and such. Um, so they, 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 they are distinctive, that's certainly true. They're aware of being distinctive. Bramley writes in 1915, um, in this uh, fantastic pamphlet he writes, which I've taken the, the title from, that's cohesion or spurious patriotism, he writes in 1915, our indignation becomes so strong against Germany that well-known class-conscious socialists are turned into recruiting sergeants and famous trade union leaders into the most jingo supporters ever placed at the disposal of any government. So they are aware of being in a minority, but nevertheless, um, there is this internationalist <coughs> ground that is represented within the furnishing trades. Um, and in a sense, what I want to do today um, is not really sort of describe those anti-war activities in, uh, in any detail, though I'm more than happy to, um, to go into that in, in, in uh, questions and discussion, but really to sort of pose that as a question. How is it that within this union, there are these internationalist countercurrents that are expressed so clearly, even where you get this sort of, you know, rush to the flag amongst quite a number of trade union leaders in 1914. So that's really the, the sort of question I'm, I'm going to, to, to focus on. And what I'm going to suggest is it represents um, 
two things really. One, it's the coming together of a particular generational experience and basically that's the generation of Britain's pioneering generations of socialists. Because these people, you know, in a sense by trade, they're trade union officers, but their political formation is that of socialist recruits of the 1890s or very early 1900s. Um, so it's a sort of generational experience. They've got a political formation of uh, a socialist, but that's combined with a very distinctive trade union experience, the industrial culture of the furnishing trades. Um, and if I have time, I'll also um, just take the story a little bit forward uh, beyond the war and suggest that uh, in a, uh, a strange way, um, this internationalism that's expressed within the furnishing trades has a brief moment of ascendancy within the wider British labour movement in the 1920s. It's part of the reaction against the First World War. Um, I mentioned it's only a relatively small union, um, but just to anticipate that later point, briefly in um, 24, 25, 26, these two figures behind me um, occupy the two key positions in the TUC. That's to say they are the secretary and sort of chairman stroke president of the TUC. Gives them considerable leverage and it's at precisely that moment that in a sense they try and articulate these internationalist positions through the TUC itself. Notably through a very um, controversial delegation they send to the new workers Russia and Soviet Russia. I'll come to that if I've got some time. Um, okay. But so to deal with, it, with that, that first point then, so this, this sort of generation of um, socialist activists who become trade union officers. Um, and generally, if you read sort of labor history, these are regarded, um, they're not really looked at very much as individuals or even as a group. They're regarded as a rather <coughs> faceless, anonymous um, set of people. Actually to write a line like uh, I try to do of, of Purcell really is like a massive job of uh, a detective work because they're not the sorts of people who leave papers and piles of private correspondence. They, um, there are no real archives here. You have to sort of go excavating the various traces of them in things like union journals, the labour press and so on. Um, there, was a, there was a book, the um, Sociologist, famous sociologist Sigmund Bauman wrote a, his, his first book in English was about the British Labour movement um, and he, he calls them, I think it's colourless, dry and dull. These are like functionaries who make their careers in the Labour movement that's already been set up. They're much less heroic, romantic figures than the sort of agitational figures that preceded them people like Tom Mann or whoever it might be, or even, even into that period, people might talk in that way, someone like A.J. Cook, the miners' leader. But generally, um, in this period, there's a massive expansion of the trade union apparatus. The numbers of trade union officers um, quintuples between the early 1890s and the end of the First World War. Generally, uh, you know, people haven't looked very much at, at, in terms of the ideas and values of these people. Um, but many of them, certainly the furnishing trades, all, the, all of the officers of the furnishing trades um, are, have been lifelong socialists from a very early age. Um, um, someone, well, I mean, both of the, the individuals I'm talking about are, are if, if you, there's, a, there's a, an unusual enterprise undertaken in the, in the mid-1920s, which is the um, the compilation of an alternative Labour's who's who, just like the you know the other who's who, but it's it's just Labour movement figures. So just like the other who's who, it asks the uh, those who are in it for their recreations. And the interesting um, thing is that people of this generation, that the, you know these trade union bureaucrats, they always give as their recreations things like propaganda, Labour and socialist meetings. Lecturing for societies, etc., of workers too poor to pay fees. That's the anarchist, the only anarchist trade union leader of the time, a shop assistant's um, official, um, John Turner. So these are people that have given hours, weeks, and years 
of their lives to movements like the Socialist Sunday Schools, the Clarion Van Lectures, Labour Colleges and Syndicalism. Actually, if you just push to the next image, um, if it's the right one. So that, there's Fred Bramley as a, as a younger man. And that was the, that Clarion Van. Um, it was like this sort of a socialist missionary enterprise that used to go around the towns and industrial settlements of Northern England. And Fred Bramley, uh, for a few years, worked full time, just sort of standing there, sometimes indoors, in the summer, usually outdoors, just sort of proselytizing for socialism. So that was his background before he ever became a uh, trade union official. And just to come to the next image as well, I think, that's, um, if it's the right one. And that's Purcell, that's at the Clarion Cafe um, in Market Street in Manchester, where he's pictured at the time of a visit by uh, James Connolly to Manchester, the Irish socialist. Um, and Purcell has been involved in you know, since the 1890s, when he first attends the, um, the, 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 the International Labour Congress in 1896 in London, he's been involved in a whole gamut of activities. He's one of the founders of syndicalist movement in Britain with, with Tom Mann. He's been a socialist councillor in Salford, heavily involved in <coughs> independent working class education and so on. So that's part of their whole makeup. So it's true, they're trade union officers, trade union bureaucrats, if we want to think of them that way. Excuse me, is that Murphy behind Bramley there? Is that uh, Jack Murphy back there? It looks like Larkin over there. I don't know if it Larkin. is Murphy. Yeah, I, I don't know all those people are, aren't they? It's Larkin all right. They're trying to, I, I don't think it is Murphy though. But they have, that, this is a, a photo they have in the Working Class Movement Library, which is this fantastic library we have in, in Salford, where it has been sent round trying to identify who these people are. The I don't know. It's a famous picture, which has got Colin Lee, Larkin, Big Bill Haywood in it. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know, but if you do know who any of them are, because I know they try, that's one of the things they're trying, you know, they've got these photos, oh, yeah. and so often there's nothing really but you know, they're not annotated, there's nothing on the back. So you're just trying to match up <laughs> the images. So if you do know any of them. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. But, um, but so that, and it's actually, it's particularly the case, I think, with the smaller unions, because if you think like the coal unions, um, and like syndicalism within the, within the miners' unions, there is that sense that the, the miners have that sort of industrial strength and that aspiration of the mines for the miners it's a realisable aspiration. Maybe the whole idea of the socialist commonwealth, that can be realised through mobilising groups like the miners or the railway workers, whoever. For the furnishing trades, there it's a, a much smaller union, sort of craft-based union scattered all over the country. So they're not that strong industrially. There are some bitter industrial disputes, but there's no way they can envisage actually realising their socialist aspirations through the furnishing trades. So what you, you find is that they, they get heavily involved in wider labour movement activities. So Purcell, for example, I mean, he's very much involved in Manchester and Salford Trades Council, and that's where he ends up his life, as, uh, after this interlude in national and international politics, as secretary of the Trades Council. Um, Bramley, it's also true of, and, and later the TUC also, they, you, you find, you know, one of the reasons for this anomaly that these small unions play such an important role within the TUC um, is partly they, they gravitate towards those broader movements through which they can envisage a real effectiveness. Um, so that's the one aspect. You know, these that these are, are trade. You know, they're trade unionists. I suppose they're socialists first, and they find in trade union office a relatively sort of congenial type of occupation through which they can seek to realise something like their aspirations. So they're serious trade unionists, um, but nevertheless it gives them the opportunity to pursue the sorts of activities they want to pursue. The other aspect I've mentioned is specific to the furnishing trades. Why is it such an internationalist union? Because there are lots of um, you know, trade unionists, one could say that, and then after is, 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 is particularly interesting. I'd say two reasons in particular. One, it has this extremely variegated ethnic composition. Um, a 
large number of, you know, the sort of Jewish migrants from Eastern Europe that come into Britain. Um, they, uh, they're, they're a, a, a significant proportion of the furnishing trades are drawn from that population. In places like Manchester and Liverpool, in London, there are what at that time they caused that specifically Hebrew branches of the Union. Um, but at the same time, the Union, you know, there have been specifically Jewish furnishing workers unions, but the Union is, you know, <laughs> on the sort of basis of unity is strength, tries to incorporate them all within this amalgamation of furnishing trades, organises, despite that form of branch, ethnically based branch organisation. Uh, tries to have broader activities. Purcell, for example, organises um, each year, it's like a big jamboree at Hardcastle Crags, which is a beauty spot in uh, near Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire. And he describes it as containing all sectors, both sexes, Jews, Gentile, German and Pole, the fraternising of all districts and grades. Um, as I've mentioned, the, the um, during the First World War, the Union takes a very strong stance. For example, there are anon anonymous letters, or sometimes public protests, um, directed at particular German or Hungarian or Austrian members. Alex Gossett, the Secretary uh, of the Union, very early in the war, says in words which I don't, if you think, in more recent events, haven't lost their force, surely we as trade unionists are not prepared to stoop to such low depths as this, in other words, to turn on our own fellow workers. So there's the ethnicity is partly a factor. And there's also a sort of link between, I think, the relative mobility of labour and products within the furnishing industry. In other words, the type of industry that it is. Furnishing obviously is an industry in which production isn't tied to locality in which it's required. It's not tied to natural resources like the extractive industries. So that gives employers the sense that you can move production about um, as, a, as a tool that you use against the workers. There's no great investment tied up in plant or site developments. There are no great advantages in, um, in any particular location. So there's this a sort of, I suppose you can think of it as a spatial dimension to um, industrial conflict. This sense that from the union's perspective, the key issue that it has to confront are what it thinks of as cheap labour districts. And how do you organise in, in cheap labour districts? Um, and I think from, it, from a trade union perspective, if you have that, confront that sort of issue, there are two basic responses. Um, one is that you try and exclude the, the products or, the, or, or, or sometimes the labour itself in terms of cheap labour districts. The other is one based on trying to recognise and organise around the common interests of workers in different districts. And broadly, the, the furnishing trades perspective, not always, but broadly, um, it adopts a position that you must try and organise these workers, including these, these cheap labour districts um, that seem to be undercutting organised workers. And it's that that I think links with the internationalism of the furnishing trades. Um, there's a big dispute which Bramley, um, so he's actually gone now, for, uh, gesticulated to him, that um, he's, he's basically the protagonist of in High Wycombe near London, which is the centre of the furnishing trades, in 1913. Um, Bramley, in that dispute, describes how at the close of the working day, motor wagons, drays and conveyances of all kinds are loaded up and goods are sent, load after load, direct to the London market, dispatched like farm produce daily to the consumer in the great city. And Purcell, he's a Manchester-based organiser of the same union, he's trying to mobilise solidarity and boycotts from Manchester. He says at the same time how High Wycombe sends chairs to every town in the kingdom. It therefore competes against every town, strengthen it, and correspondingly we strengthen every other centre. Now if you think of that passage and just replace the word town with country, you know, strength, um, is we strengthen whichever country 
might be seen as a cheap labour district. That's the sort of logic of trade union internationalism that Bramley and Purcell try and pursue in the 1920s, where they, um, they, they adopt this logic of um, basically you know, trying to extend trade union principles in countries like India, in China, where there is an insurgent labour movement really in the 1920s. <coughs> So it's initially expressed in, in, um, in, in sort of domestic terms, but the logic is one um, that can be um, equally figured in terms of, of um, an international context. The other thing that's interesting that links directly with the positions they take in the First World War is that within the furnishing trades, not only the workers, but also the employers are ethnically differentiated. And it's this that means that the, um, that the furnishing trades um, offer a strong affirmation of a class principle, basically no distinction of race, colour or creed, and no acceptance of the attempted exploitation of ethnic and national divisions by the employers. And there's a logic there that is tr transferred straight from a particular dispute like the one in High Wycombe that looks quite a sort of parochial local affair that is then two years later translated in more or less exactly the same terms to the logic of the First World War. So Purcell at that time, he refers to the, uh, the employer's Jew-Gentile octopus hypocritically playing on ethnic tensions. Bramley, it's more interesting, he notes how with the employers as a union organiser, his mission has always been the same, namely, to ask them, this is quoting him, to ask them to pay something. And it's true, wonderfully true, that where interests are identical, racial sentiments or religious feeling make no difference. An employer is the same person every time they buy labour. Um, they want it like wood in the cheapest market. And it's exactly that, this logic that he expresses two years later in this, it's, I, I think it's just a brilliant pamphlet that he writes um, in 1915, Class Cohesion or Spurious Patriotism, that I've never seen it mentioned anywhere. I just found it um, just going through a Labour archive. I've never seen any reference made to it or to Bramley uh, and, and his role. Um, but it expresses a, a, you know, a sort of ILP perspective on the war, of opposition to the war, but with this distinctive trade union inflection where he insists, even in 1915, on what he sees as the cohesion of these warring nations um, and the hidden affinities of the social and political elites who on both sides are sending their workers to these utterly pointless deaths. Um, and he writes um, in a way that I think is just incontrovertible. There's much more affinity between the ruling and royal classes of foreign countries than there is at any time between workers and the upper classes in the same country. Class feeling and exclusiveness is so far developed amongst the aristocracies of Europe that even now, even at the height of this war and the denunciations of the Hun and so on, even now the average British aristocrat would notwithstanding the vilification of German character, sooner marries daughter to a German count than a British bricklayer. Which I think is true. And actually, if you think of the way the sorts of forms of um, residential and educational segregation you can see in London now as a sort of in city of international capital, I think it's, it remains just as true. Um, and so there is this powerful undercurrent of internationalism that's expressed in a distinctly, you know, a, a trade union form of internationalism. It's very much our interests as workers in unity across national borders. Um, I said if I had time, if I got another five minutes, just to, just to a, a sort of, just go into the sequel, perhaps, in terms of um, where this leads to. Obviously, this is a minority position within the unions. Even by the end of the war, when it, it, it requires, I suppose, less courage than it did perhaps in 1914 and 1915 to express these views, nevertheless, it's always a minority position within the unions. Nevertheless, um, there is this anomaly that I mentioned 
which I think is, is you know, it tells us something quite interesting about the nature of the British labour movement at that time. That in 1917, although Bramley has, has expressed these views and been denounced for these views at trade union conferences, conferences of the General Federation of Trade Unions and so on throughout the war, nevertheless, in 1917, he is appointed essentially the first ever full-time officer of the TUC. He's initially, he's assistant secretary, but the secretary uh, is, a, is a more nominal role, so he basically does the work, and then he becomes secretary. Um, and so, and he, he says, you know, this is, says something about the trade union movement, despite his expressing unpopular views, because he's seen as a good trade unionist, there is an acceptance of that. Um, and you can see from the, from the moment, well, particularly from the end of the war in 1918, when a, there's not just a reconstruction of, you know, some sort of European order at Versailles and new states and so on, there has to be a reconstruction of the international labour movement. It's not least because of Bramley that the TUC plays a much more central role in that reconstruction than it's ever had done in the years before the war. Um, and then, as I say, there's this, there's this, um, there's this uh, s sort of strange period, really, where almost fortuitously, Purcell, at the beginning of 1924, when you get the formation of the first Labour government, um, becomes the um, president of the TUC. And between them, they occupy the, those two key positions um, that gives them this, as I say, very considerable leverage in terms of what, you know, um, a scope um, for initiative, I suppose, in terms of what the TUC does. And it's in that period that, as I say, there's a, there's a big delegation sent to Soviet Russia at the end of 1924, um, which in a sense they project this sense of internationalism now onto Soviet Russia, which is seen by many as this sort of pariah state in Europe, but they, they want to recognise the Russian unions. You can see partly that same sense of class solidarity. You can see with Bramley, very clear links with his positions during the First World War, because some within the Labour movement say, what about those political prisoners in Russia? What about imprisoned trade unionists? The Bolsheviks aren't so gentle with people like us. And his reaction is almost that he, he just as in the First World War, he's not going to give credence to atrocity stories, almost as a matter of principle. He says this very clearly in the First World War. These are just stories. We, we don't have anything to do with those because they're just used to build up antagonism towards the Germans. And, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, he, 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 does, he takes the same position regarding some of the allegations, which, of course, many of which are true against the Bolsheviks. But, they, so, but they, so they adopt these internationalist positions. They set up a, a trade union committee um, with, the, with the Russians, Purcell is president of the International Federation of Trade Unions um, for three years. If you read some of his pronouncements in that period, for example, where he talks about, um, really he's talking about globalisation, particularly emphasising the role of China, and therefore we need to wake up to the world as it really is, and we as a labour movement need to be thinking in more expansive terms, beyond national borders. That... Um, you know, that all flows from this strand of internationalism. In 1925, the TUC, um, there's a resolution passed, doesn't have any consequences, but nevertheless there's a resolution passed by an overwhelming vote, which is a categorical denunciation of imperialism in the British Empire. And it's moved by Purcell for the furnishing trades, and it's seconded by a Boilermakers delegate, who is the Harry Pollitt, the Become, later becomes the secretary of the Communist Party. So, um, you know, um, I, I suppose what to just draw to a conclusion then, what, um, you know, or what conclusions can one draw from that? I suppose, you know, I've been thinking, I've been, been to a number of events like this, thinking about the issues of opposition to the First World War, the great difficulties of the opposition to the First World War. The point that I would um, make perhaps by looking at figures like Purcell and Bramley and Gossip and others is that actually I think it's 
I think there's a lot to be said for looking at things in a longer term perspective. Movements don't just come out of nowhere. One of the problems that I had with the film of Ken Loach's on the spirit of 1945, which is a good film in many respects, is it's almost like, where did that come from? It's like a spirit almost that comes like the genie out of the lamp. There's no real sense of the movements, campaigns, activism that over 20, 30, 40, 50 years beforehand had made that breakthrough, that moment of ascendancy in 1945 possible. And this, I would say exactly the same in terms of the attempt to crystallise some sort of um, movement against the First World War between 1914 and 18, where it's most successful, it actually t taps into a much deeper current of internationalism that one can trace back in the years before the First World War and conversely, one can see carrying through into the interwar period and the reaction against the First World War. Thank you. thinking that NAFTA uh, members had some involvement in the aircraft industry. Um, my father was convener of the main assembly at the Avalons in Christchurch when they were still building some wooden frames there. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that they had members of the, uh, most of them were AEU, but I'm pretty sure that they had members of NAFTA working in the, uh, working in the, um, on the construction of wooden frames. So there would have been certainly during in during World War One, um, the, I mean, the aircraft were exclusively wood, weren't they? In those days, so. no, that's true. Although that, that one of the things that I mean, one of the things for NAFTA was that it wasn't really a craft union and it wasn't really an industrial union, and it did come into it had tensions with unions like the AEU, like the railwaymen, like cooperative employees in terms of. Sh it felt it should be organising those workers, um, but quite often it was, it, you know... There well, well, what I'm getting at this is whether the members were involved in more work or not. Um, they were, yeah. but quite a small minority of the union. So, uh, but, but um, something like, I couldn't give the exact percentage. Um, so it wasn't like the AEU in terms of, you know, munitions being the main sector, but yeah, they were. Do you mean in terms of what was the issue come of disrupting well, I mean, production? Yeah, whether they had any kind, whether there was any tension um, with them doing the more work, whether they might have refused, or whether non-union like, you know, whether they were afraid. Not that I've seen, and in fact, I mean, there's one of the, the one of the, um, that's probably like one of the limitations, like when people talk about client side and the engineers and so on, not making those connections. Um, between the what they're doing as workers and what they express politically. Mm. I think with, particularly with NAFTA, um, even more so than with the engineers, because they hadn't, they didn't really think in terms of what they could do with their industrial strength that much. Um, so the anti-war activities were done through, almost like um, the Union Act, um, articulating, it didn't get involved with things like the Treasury Agreement, it did, it was opposed to industrial conscription and so on, but they're like sort of trade union positions as well. Mm. Um, but it didn't, for example, not that I've seen, or any element in it, suggest they should take industrial action mm. and not be involved in war production. Whereas the IWW in the States did actively try and, and, and try and sabotage production and stop ships moving and things like that. You know. But I think maybe, I mean, some of the people who say afterwards, you know, things like with, with, like with Clydeside and so on, that was the great limitation of these movements, that they, there was they, that separation between what they did as workers and then some of the political positions they articulated. So they, they fundamentally focused on economic, yeah. you know, on using industrial power for economic purposes. Exactly. Purposes. Yeah. I was struck particularly by your point about Brown Nafta being appointed to a position in, in the TUC in 1917, subsequently becoming the secretary of the TUC, when he'd taken such a, a controversial position on the war. What does it say about the political culture of the 
um, trade union and the political movement because the 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 ILP um, opposition uh, to the war, uh, you know, they, they were were absorbed back into the into the Labour movement subsequently and the Labour Party. I think in a way, returned. I mean, this might even you know it ties in a little bit with the with, with the other question because um, because. Bradley in particular, I mean Purcell, I mean he was seen as a militant and he goes to Russia in 1920, he moves the resolution which, which brings the Communist Party into being, and he's, you know, he's been involved with Tom Mann, so he is very much seen as a militant figure. Bradley would describe himself in trade, as a trade union moderate, he's never, he never goes anywhere near the Communist Party, nor would he have done. Um, and so, um, although he expresses very, you know, he not only expresses this sort of anti-war position, but like there's a Beatrice Webb has a passage in her diaries where she attends the meeting of the No Conscription Fellowship in 1916, and says they're mostly young middle class, mostly middle class young men. I recognise only one trade unionist, and that's Bramley. You know that. So he's, you know, he's so he, he 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 adopts those positions, but as a trade union moderate. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I mean, Bramley, and I go, it's like going back to the other question, he doesn't really think of using sort of industrial, it, it, he thinks of using what industrial power we have for industrial ends, mm. but he's, not, he's never been a syndicalist or anything like a syndicalist. Um, and so I think there are two reasons why um, that appointment might be possible. At, when he expresses the... Um, the, the anti-war position at the, at the general conferences of the labour movement, which he does, it's like an ILP position, he always respects, I suppose, conventions of trade union unity. And that includes um, where there are people that, for example, um, he, he makes suggestions like where Arthur Henderson, because he's in the war cabinet, what we, and there's cause for strong action against Henderson, almost treating him as a pariah. Some um, that, that, that's not going to happen, but that's what, what some want to happen. And Bramley says, no, we, we you know we exist on unity, um, and we come together for for certain things. So I think that is you know he actually says after he's elected, it shows you the tolerance that exists within the movement if you respect the culture and conventions of the trade union movement. And therefore, in a sense, that comes to that point the limitations of what the you know the trade union movements. The other thing I think is. Um, the smaller unions at that point, you know, there's the, the, it doesn't, um, there's a reluctance to have someone, I think, from one of the bigger unions, like from the mine workers or from the transport workers, who might be seen as actually, you know, exercising considerable weight over what, what they do. The smaller unions, it's a bit like small countries in internationalism are quite important because they don't appear as much of a threat they're going to take over. And so quite often it's the smaller unions like that. As I say, to the extent that you get this total anomaly because the furnishing trades, I think it's about 34th in size of the TUC unions, and yet it has these two figures who can significantly push the TUC in this direction of this sort of pro-Russian, pro-Bolshevik um, episode in the mid-1920s. So it's an anomaly. And, you know, just to carry that forward, it's at that point, someone like Ernest Bevin, for example, he's not even bothered going on the TUC General Council until 1925. And that's, he goes on, starts throwing his weight about, and that anomaly is soon finished. You, it's never going to happen again in TUC history. I worked well, so pretty about High Wycombe. Um, I don't know how much you know. I, I actually went to school in High Wycombe when I was a teenager, but um, and I knew a little bit about the furniture trade and all that. But um, just a couple of things. First of all, that strike you mentioned. Um, I, I didn't realise. I, I, my question is really: is do you know how radical the tradition of High Wycombe is in the Labour movement? Because very interestingly, and it is the wrong period. It's all wrong historically. But in 1831, during the Swing Riots. High Wycombe was the, one of the few places where factory workers joined up with agricultural rioters and they burned their factories down in, in High Wycombe. Right? And they, it was, a, it, it was the, one of the main places where there was a crossover between light industrial workers 
and ag rural labourers who were in this huge movement which spread across the country. So I found that interesting, and Heidekin was clearly something to do, it was something to do with the furniture trade, I remember reading about it in Captain Swing by Hobsbawm and Ruday. But also, I just wondered whether that, there was some kind of radical tradition there, and, and well, did that relate to the furniture trade in general, like the shoemakers were, sort of thing? I don't, I mean, I, the answer is I, I don't know that much about Higher Wickham, except as I've, as I've come across it through the, you know, the NAFTA journals and, and through this dispute. Um, I mean, it is the major centre, or in as much as there is one, of the furnishing trades. Um, and I think, as you say, it's like it's this old woodworking centre, but it's seen as, I think, as a threat to the sort of, the, the union in the better organised London districts. But there clearly is militancy there, because this is a big dispute. You know, in, in as much as the furnishing trades have any role in the sort of great unrest before the First World War, this is where it happens. It's quite a bit of dispute, and the union basically wins. So there's significant support for it there. Whether there are links um, over a longer period, um, I don't know. Although that's something I would be really interested, you know, I, I just finished off by saying it's interesting to trace these internationalist currents back. Um, um, but I think it's, it's quite possible that there would be. One of the things that struck me in relation to the furnishing trades is that William Lovett, the chartist, um, he, um, in, back in the 1840s or 1830s and 40s, he is probably the first real trade union internationalist because there's a whole series of, it, they're in the form of addresses to French working men, addresses to the Polish people oppressed by the Tsar and, and so on and so forth. Again, a, a very, you know, he's a, a cabinet maker, I think, a very clear sense of internationalism well, not only is that quite interesting, you know, in the way you're suggesting, can, can you, you can spot these things at different times, but he is invoked and quoted in the later period. So there is some sort of collective memory. They quote Tom Paine and people like that. It is a sense they think of that as part of their heritage. Um, but as to the deep, there was somebody, um, somebody called Paul Burnham, I think based in High Wycombe, who did do much more detailed research on High Wycombe itself, but I haven't done that, I'm afraid. I can pick up on some of the issues that uh, Kevin raised. I'm going to look at the Forest of Dean Miners Association, and in particular look at initially how the government sought the collaboration of the min miners' unions nationally, and in particular uh, in the Forest of Dean with the uh, Forest of Dean Miners Association and how eventually um, rank and file miners in the forest resisted this collaboration and how the, the miners union was actually transformed uh, how the miners union was transformed in the process I mean similarly I mean there were loads of currents which were organising against the war, war like uh, the, uh, leading in, particularly leading up to the war, the British Socialist Party, the uh, Socialist Labour Party, and during the war, the no, con no Conscription Fellowship and the Union of Democratic Control. Now, as far as I know, none of these organisations had any uh, influence or base in the Forest of Dean. Um, as far as the suffragettes are concerned, in 1914, they did make an intervention at the, uh, every year the Forest of Dean Miners has this sort of huge um, celebration and rally speech house and the suffragettes did make an, in an intervention there but I um, don't think it went down very well actually but I think that's probably an, a, 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 another story. So um, here we have on, up here on the screen we have some Forest Dean Miners. Uh, there were probably about uh, a dozen deep pits of any significant size, um, and probably only about half a dozen where there was uh, there was more than more than 500 miners. This is one of the smaller pits, uh, just uh, uh, outside Cinderford. Um, and that's kind of you know that's kind of what, what the, pit, the pits look like. That was one of the one of the bigger deep pits, and about 
apprehend about 500 miners. They're just sort of in the middle of middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere. People had to walk walk there early in the morning to get to the ship. Um, the Miners' Federation of Great Britain was made was a federated organisation made up of, lo of local uh, uh, local regional unions, and uh, each local union had a miners' agent. Who, who, was a, who was a paid union official, and they were incredibly powerful. I mean, they were like czars in their own country, and um, they had, a, they had the, the politics and their their general attitudes and approaches. Were, were, you know, were, you know, that were, were very uh, influential in how the, how the local uh, uh, miners' unions were run. Um, and this, uh, this, this is a quote from. Uh, from Rowlandson, uh, it, uh, this is 1917, and I use this uh, quote as a basis uh, for the title of my pamphlet. I mean, hopefully, it speaks for itself. And you know, the government's main concern through through the war was keeping the supply of coal, which is so essential for the war industry, but they also needed men to fight in the front. It was, a, it was that kind of balance and that sort of tension which ran through the miners' uh, region throughout the war. But these are the sort of main, there was loads of people in, in, involved in the forest League, but these are, these are the, main, the main characters. I mean, Robert Smiley was the, the national, national president, George Rodinson was the miners' agent up to, up to um, spring 1918. He was taken over by Herbert Booth. Harry Webb, the Liberal MP, the Forest of Dean, and a mate of George Rodinson. James Wignall became Labour MP, spring 1918. And then we have uh, just a small number I've listed here of some of the activists whose names will, will come up through, through the talk. And they, they, they had a very different attitudes and different politics. Um, there, was lo there was quite a few others, but I, I, I just listed these for now. Okay. So this gives you an idea of the um, of the politics of of, of, of George Rowlandson. Um, this was a quote uh, from a book written written by Chris Fisher, uh, and this is a, a reflection on his uh, appointment in 1886, having taken over from the previous uh, agent, Edward Ryman. Um, this is a kind of fairly sort of li typical sort of liberal view of, of, of trade unionism. Okay. And this is this is this is uh, Rowlandson there with the uh, uh, moustache at the end of the baggy trail. This is a coal miner, and he, he was very friendly with the local coal miners. And that was after um, uh, a pit disaster in 1902. Um, okay. And this is Harry Webb, the local Liberal MP, a mate, a mate of George Rowlandson. Um, I think that speaks for itself, of course it is. Okay. And these are the sort of conditions that some of the miners that he, he, he was representing uh, were working in. You can see the scenes there, you know, sometimes the scenes are even smaller than that, only about 18 inches, so that, you know, they often have to work on their on their hands and knees in the pits. Another one. He did, that's road ripping out towards the scene, and they're actually raising the roof so they can get the coal out. And Twenty inch seat further in. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly have a quick look at what was happening pre-war when socialist ideas start, started um, gaining credence in the forest. I mean, they were actually um, I mentioned that some of the other left-wing orga organisations didn't have any, have any influence, but the Independent Labour Party had branches in not from, uh, from 1908 onwards in most of the major villages and towns, and so that, so there was an influence of, of the Independent Labour Party. This was this was a quote from Charles Stanton at the annual miners' demonstration, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, he 
he was very much involved in the, the huge wave of industrial unrest which mm. took over uh, South Wales uh, in, in this period. You know, people, I expect you've heard of Tony Pandy. Um, he was involved in Aberdeer, very violent um, industrial action where, where um, the troops were sent in. And, uh, <laughs> He, he, is, he, is a, he is a sort of similar sort of figure to Ben Tillett, very combative trade unionist, but I mean, sadly, you know, ended up, you know, similar to Tillett on the right wing of the Labour movement in, uh, and taken a pro-war uh, line. So, in, so we, had, we started having, a, um, having a, about this time, we started getting an, an increase in the industrial unrest in the forest. And these are two of the strikes that took place in 1911. This was just this was, you know, after Stanton came to the uh, forest mine, forest miners demonstration. Um, the first one was an actually an unofficial dispute over uh, use of non-union labour, um, and it was led by um, a man called James Says, who was an ILP member and, and uh, uh, an activist within the, within the. Uh, Forest Sea Miners Association. Another dispute, um, Flower and McCollery over, over the uh, agreement that, get, that, that was drawn up uh, over the, the, the rates that people got paid, that, that the humans got paid for the tonnage they produced. So they, they were basically on piecework rates. So that was a dispute. That actually did get us, that was an official dispute. But Rowlandson was very, very keen to. to, to, to to resolve it, and you had to pull in people from outside the area to 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 bring, bring the dispute to the end. To, uh, he had to brought, bring in miners, officials from outside the area to bring the dispute to an end. Right, next one. Um, this is all this built up to the, 19, the first national miner strike in, in 1912, um, and this is a, just a quote from. Uh, a, a local miner, Harry Barton, who, who, who remembers the strike. Uh, you can see, only I mean, he went down and pitted 13, so uh, he, he was obviously very young at the time. Um, it it was only a partial victory, and it hit. It wasn't a very. It, it, it didn't really help the miners in the forest because Rowlandson uh, ex accepted an agreement that there should be an exception made for the forest to deal. Uh, because the conditions in the pits were so bad and the profits that the miners could, could make as a result uh, would, you know, would, would, would be vast, vastly reduced if, if uh, they got, the, got a national minimum wage so an exception was made in the forest and the rates they got were a lot less, less in two other areas which caused quite a lot of bitterness. So here, here we have just the rise of, 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 sort of socialist and Labour Party politics, um, and you know that was quite a big meeting of 600 people. So you, you start again a, a conflict here between the Liberals uh, in the union, represented by Rowlandson, and, the, and those miners who, who are seeking uh, working class or, uh, representation in Parliament. Uh, one of the main people involved in this is uh, David Organ. Um, here he is, uh, he's right there in the middle. He, he became uh, very influential in the uh, uh, Forestry Miners Association and uh, was the uh, president during the uh, 1926 general strike. So he, he immediately became, came into conflict with Robinson. He just given an, an idea of the sort of conditions again in the sort of you know organ because I work at 14 as a hodder and this this is a, this is a quote from Eric Warren who also worked as a hodder in the forest pits and you can if, if you read it it gives you an idea of the sort of conditions uh, you know that, that, that they had to work in. It's the, the very last sentence is, is in forest dialects. So <laughs> get the idea. 
Right, okay. So the, uh, um, David Organ worked at Norton Colliery as, as a Czech wayman. And quite often you would find that some of the people who became, they're almost like uh, union officials. It, you know, their, their job was to check, because the, 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 the heroes were being paid on peace rates, they, their job was to check the, the weight, the coal, so, so that the, because the, 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 the mine owners had their own weighmen as well, so it was just a check, it was absolutely crucial, you, you know, they get the, they get the weight, the coal right, because that, that determined how much the miners got paid. So you quite often find that the, 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 the union activists ended up being working as check weighmen, and they were kind of, it was almost like they were shop stewards or whatever, I mean, I mean James says it, you know, was, was, was a check weighman, we mentioned earlier, was a check weighman, it, uh, so here we start. We, we now start having a direct challenge to Rowlandson's le leadership for the agency. Uh, William Smith uh, from Colford, he was a, an independent Labour Party member, socialist, and um, you can get the general drift if you read that quote. Uh, about you know the kind of conflict you know that, that you know that was building up in the union. Reuben James was a hewer from Bream. Uh, so this is now just beginning. This leading up to the First World War. Uh, this is in the. May, June of 1914, we had the Triple Alliance, we had demonstrations through Lydney of railway workers and miners, Smith, William Smith was speaking, a lot of confidence, a lot of sense that you know, we're really going to move forward here, you know, uh, you know, the atmosphere you know, was, was very positive, they were inviting um, uh, people over, these South African um, Trade unions were actually staying staying in the forest for, 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 for several months. So, you know, there obviously was a lot of political debate going on. Um, I mean, the interesting thing, there's something very interesting about this quote. So I don't know if anyone else can spot it. If you look at the last word. So at this stage, the, the internationalism seems to be confined to the empire. So, um... Would they have been white or black miners? White. White. White, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, I, I've read a bit about it. I mean, they, they did talk about the conditions of black miners and were getting paid a lot, lot less. Yeah. So, yeah, there was internationalism, but it was limited. Uh, so, um... So we had now we have the out outbreak of war, sort of massive, massive shock, considering you know how confident the people were feeling just before. And uh, this is just a I've I, I discovered this book by Brock Millman on 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 uh, uh, how the British government dealt with this dissent during the war, and he, he makes it he makes a point very strongly in the book that you know the issue for him was the government's main concern was, was the threat of war. Or, 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 or at least the, the danger of the intellectuals in, in the anti-war movement linking up with organised labour. So Smiley was um, president of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain. He was, and he, you know, he, he, he was quoted as saying he saw the First World War as an absolute disaster. For, for, for the uh, working class in this country, but he was very careful to express outright opposition to the war. And like a lot of trade union, trade union leaders, except, except for the ones that Kevin were talking about, this was kind of very typical um, how, they, how they sought to, to protect the interests of their members during the war. There he is, with a smiley. One. This is uh, some of the attempts by the government to to, to start controlling uh, the trade unions and limiting any any opposition that you know that, that could build up against the war. You can 
can see it, it, yeah, that quite a lot, large number of trade unionist anti-war activists were arrested under the Defence of the Realm Act during the war. So this is, you know, these very, very severe control mechanisms were put into place. Immediately, this is August 1914, so straight away, you know, they, they introduced that. So we're look now starting to look at you know, how, how, how the war started to impact on the forest and island community. Um, you know, initially, you know, the uh, you know, government was very aware initially they didn't want they didn't want all you know huge numbers of miners joining up. So and uh, obviously initially um, recruitment was on a voluntary basis anyway. So next one. Here we have a meeting organised in Cinderford in early September, chaired by uh, Rowlandson here. Then you've got uh, Harry Webb, the Liberal MP, Francis Brain, uh, coal mine owner, Russell Kerr, local uh, magistrate and huge landowner, Meredith, coal owner, Chap coal mine owner, Chapness, coal mine owner. Uh, I don't know who Westway is, but you know, pretty well all the, the miners, uh, the coal mine owners were there, and Rowlandson was actually at the heart of the meeting, chairing the meeting, loads of, you know, the usual kind of war pro propaganda, encouraging people to sign up. So this is kind of the kind of response pe uh, for, for, you, for the ordinary miner, there wasn't really a lot of choice. You either had to work in the pit or you joined up because there was nothing else you could do. Really. You had to survive somehow, you had to make money. You know, and so people made their choices. You know, they either worked, carried on working in the pit. As people signed up, there were more jobs in the pit. So what some people joined the mine, <coughs> became miners who wouldn't done otherwise. It was pretty awful conditions in the pit. So with mean, the idea that you know, the war could be over by Christmas, I suppose, seemed probably was quite, seemed quite a reasonable idea just to get, get out and join them. So Barton decides to join. This is another, another uh, local miner, Joe Kent. Um, if you read that, it probably tells you his story. I mean, what is quite interesting is that the military used to go around forest pubs in the evening recruiting people, you know, <laughs> signing them up when they were drunk, basically. You know. you know, they were desperate to get people. So, it, I don't think people in the forest were actually that enthusiastic about the war. If you look at those statistics, um, the popular. There were 6,000 miners, the total population including women was 28,000. Um, so, I mean, obviously half of those. No, sorry, that's 28,000 men. The total population is 28,000 men. Um, obviously, a lot of those are not of military age or, 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 or too old or whatever, so it's difficult to work out an exact figure for percentage who joined who, 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 who were fit and well to join. But interestingly, by this time, 20% of South Wales miners had joined. So there's a significant, significant difference, really. So there's a lot more war and more willingness to join in South Wales. What the reasons are is obviously, you know, it could be because people just were so, you know, exhausted and tired of working in the pits and just wanted to get out. But anyway. So. So some people join. This is um, Harris. People, miners were, were were quite recruited, but they they were they were deemed to have particular skills, and they were using tunnelling. So they, they were targeted. A lot, all sorts of battalions came down to the forest to try and recruit people. It wasn't just the Gloucestershire battalion. So you had people coming out from the Worcestershires, you know, different re different um, regiments would come down to recruit people. So here we now we have, have the increasing uh, state control, um, and this is the, uh, the Munitions Act. Um, uh, 
the Midas leader Smiley walked out because <coughs> refused to participate in the agreement. Next one. But uh, immediately the government started becoming very concerned about maintaining the supply of coal. They were losing men, miners were volunteering, so some of the more skilled men were, were joining up. And they, they needed to guarantee the supply of coal. It's absolutely essential, particularly steam coal for the, mun for the munitions industry. So, so that they did a deal with the Miners Federation of Great Britain. That's uh, they deal with the containment holidays and stop days, and the deal was that you know that non-union members would, would be uh, encouraged to join by the managers. So it was a, you know. and this is um, a, a response uh, uh, from William Smith, was now gradually moving to a pro-war position. This, this is a quote he, he gave at a meeting, at a, re, at a recruiting meeting, when, when he was challenged uh, by, by the military about why, why forest miners weren't joining up in the, in the numbers uh, that, they, that, that they felt they, they should do. And um, I mean, that quote again you know, speaks for itself. So this is in, in 1915 government start starting to think about conscription. So they needed to work out exactly who was out there and who was available to be conscripted. Clearly, people in the forest realised what, what this was about and started getting very anxious about conscription. And they had major problems get, getting people to, to fill out forms. Uh, this is one of the court cases that took place uh, uh, with, some, with someone who, who actually had refused to fill out the report. Interestingly enough, they were both um, uh, fined on the same day under the Defence of the Realm Act for keeping uh, racing pigeons. So was that she's basically saying you can stuff your forms up your ass? She, that's basically what she said, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then they had to go to court. <laughs> and then they did them under door of having racing pigeons, like presumably they thought they were communicating with the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> they were fined a pain. So yeah, big, big thing now in South Wales, you know, the issue of, of pay, you know, the pay, pay hadn't gone up. They, they'd reached the limit of what they could get under the existing agreement and agreements that they had. And the South Wales miners, you know, much more organised than the forest miners. Uh, actually went on strike and the government you know there was a huge amount you know as you so well produces steam coal they could not they could not risk losing a, even a day's production if possible of, of steam coal so they, they immediately gave in and, and the um, and, and the uh, the miners won their dispute and that was kind of the policy through the war they knew they they did not want to aggravate they did not want strikes they wanted to keep the miners on side, and uh, they, were willing, they were willing to award pay rises to achieve that. So this started impacting on the forest. This bloke Samuel Ricard was, uh, he actually worked in the South Wales pits. You know, he, he, was, he, was, in, he was over in South Wales when all the, you know, the, 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 the industrial conflict existed in, in the great unrest. And there was quite a lot of miners who were going backwards and forwards between the forest and the South Wales. Um, so people were coming back, picking up ideas, coming back. And in a bit like ways, I'm sure forest miners might be even, even had an influence on the South Wales miners. I don't know, possibly. Um, I mean, obviously, in South Wales, you, you had a strong syndicalist tradition. Um, so, you know, that, they were probably picking up on that. So we had conscription in 1916. Um, immediately, Smiley expressed opposition to any conscription of, of any form. Um, and immediately, key workers such as miners or musician workers were exempted. So initially, the miners felt they, you know, they were safe from conscription. So. Uh, but you know, immediately you had 
you had the conscription, the local newspapers. If you look at the local newspapers at the time, I'm sure, and this certainly was the case in the Forest of Dee, and I'm sure it's the case across the country, it was just rows and rows and rows of military tribunals where people were appealing against the ascent to the front. I mean, their, their main argument was if they can get the back of, back of their employer, they needed their employer to say that they were absolutely necessary for, their, for, for them not to be conscripted. Uh, usually, they only meant you know that, that, that was, they were just given a bit of extra time to get things sorted out. Um, um, again, Rowlandson was involved in this. He sat on the uh, East End Military Tribunal along with one of the uh, uh, coal mine owners. Um, they they also introduced the colliery recruiting courts at the time. Um, they started to think about conscripting uh, people in the mine industry. Uh, they and the colliery recruiting courts were given powers to decide who could be made available for conscription, um, which meant that if you went to a military tribunal, they would just say, "Well, you know, we'll refer you back to the colliery recruiting court." And um, surface workers were, were, were started to be conscripted, and, it, and then. It, of particular interest to those men who were accused of persistent absenteeism. So basically you get the situation now that anyone was considered to be a bit of a troublemaker, a bit of a problem, a bit of, you know, falling out with Rowlandson, who was a, who was a miner's agent, or falling out with a mine owner, you know, they could be targeted. Um, you know, and the union was all beginning to be, the union were involved, with the, you know, the, Rowlandson was a representative on, the, on these courts, meant to be representing uh, his members. And also at the same time you had pit committees set up in a similar kind of role when they would look at uh, uh, if, you know, if uh, people basically are not pulling their weight. You know, this is including the managers as well as, 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 well as the, uh, the actual underground workers. Um, again, looking to possibly discipline any habitual select suckers. So again, now the union was being asked to be directly involved in disciplining the, the workforce. But again, the main issue here was absenteeism. You know, they, were, they were only just about producing enough coal to supply the munitions industry. And they, were, you know, they were trying to get people to work long hours, they were to work through the holidays, they were to work weekends. You know, this you know, really, really goes against the grain of how people traditionally worked in the mines. People were quite often had in the past taken days off if they'd been injured or they had a knock or had a bruise or whatever or they're just exhausted. Um, there were so many small injuries but now they've been asked to work flat out. So here we have um, some quotes here from uh, George Rowlandson. Uh, he, uh, he was going around or there were 40 lodges in the forest, 40, you know, if you think that's amazing, 6,000 miners, 40 lodges. So he would go around all the lodges, and he, this is the sort of stuff that he, that he was coming out with. Not surprisingly, the, the lodge meetings weren't that well attended when he, when he talked. People didn't turn up, because he, he would just sort of give these sort of long sermons, which are repeated word for word in the local papers, and they actually made quite difficult reading, to be honest because it was just full of all this kind of nonsense, really. Um, and he usually complained the fact there was no one there. And, uh, anyway. <laughs> so here, I mean, basically, you have a very divisive issue being set up. You have people who started to work in the pits after 1914 being accused of going in there to the pits, uh, you know, to, to avoid, uh, avoid being, being sent to the front. So you get a division, you know, potential division here between those, those mainly young men who went in after 1914 and the, uh, the existing work, workforce, so obviously the people that were at the front. If you didn't go to, quite often people didn't turn up to, uh, if, if they were being conscripted and uh, they didn't turn up to the military centre, or they, if they didn't turn up to, a, if they appealed and didn't turn up to a military tribunal, which is quite often the case, 
people, you know, you're, you're talking about turning up to going into a room where the top people in the establishment there, and standing in front of them and trying to make a case why you should, you know, why you shouldn't be called up. Incredibly intimidating. And these people, these are young men who left school at 14, have no no experience of public speaking. Uh, you know, it would have been very very difficult to think thing for, the, for them to do. So quite often they just didn't turn up. Um, they, they would get arrested, um, and then they'd be put in front of the uh, the, the uh, petty sessions. Rowlandson was a magistrate, and quite often he he was the one who would who would decide what happened to them, and they were always just just handed over to the military straight away, sent off to the front. Um, here you have a case of someone who obviously had fallen out, one of the sort of assistant absentees, or he, I don't know, but he clearly fallen out with uh, um, the managers or Rowlandson or all the other people at people the pit. Uh, the colliery recruiting court uh, decided they didn't, they, they didn't want him in the pit anymore. And, uh, uh, Colliery made no appeal on, appeal on his behalf because at least for other workers you could get your boss in to make an appeal on, you, on, your, on your behalf. If you were a miner and you'd fallen out, they weren't, there, they weren't interested in, it, in making an appeal on your behalf at the military tribunal. So basically you've had it. You know, you're not going to go in on your own without the backing of an employer. So um, uh, you know, you've got to be sent to the front. This just, just goes on about basically about what happened to him. It's quite sad that, you know, I'm not a scholar enough to answer that question. They weren't articulate. They, they didn't, you know, they couldn't. I was reading some of the speeches that some of the cons uh, uh, conscientious objectors made, and some of them were like Walter Ailes, and he's just incredibly eloquent, you know, these long speeches about Christian socialism and the way, you know, and. Um, I mean, it was partly a class issue, but I mean, a lot of the conscientious objectors were working class as well. But they could talk, you know. They they knew they're older. They could make the speeches. You know, sadly for people, you know, for people like Benjamin Martin, they they weren't really they didn't really stand a chance. And and then quite often they were told, anyway, if they tried to be a conscientious objector, that they're already working in the war industry, and you know, you can't be a conscientious objector because you're work, working in the war industry. So really. They, being a conscientious objector just, was, just wasn't an option for them, really. So basically, that's it. You know, you're, re you're arrested, sent to the front, and there he is. What is strange, I can never, I can't find out what happened to him. He's not in any World War I records, so it's possible he did go off to prison. I, I don't know, so if anyone's got any ideas of how to track, track him down, what happened to him. But he's not listed in any of the World War I records, so it's very strange. Anyway, yeah, here's another one. Again, you know, he can just about come up with, I didn't like to. Again, not, not a long, eloquent speech. You know, he's, not, he's going to be sent to the front. There's no, there's no chance of him, his appeal being, being accepted. But he's actually, he's actually, he's got like, petty sessions anyway. This is this wasn't actually a military tribunal. Yeah, people, sometimes people just, well, they lived in the woods. You know, they were sleeping rough in the woods. These, these, are, all, these are all young miners. Next one. And then, you, and now, um, you started having people coming back with severe in industries, a battle of Somme. These are people who did volunteer, so they started really hitting the, in, in, the, in the forest mining community what was actually happening now. You know, you have people coming back. These two, Alec Edwards, William Parry, best mates, worked at the same colliery, signed on on the same day, killed on the same day at the Battle of Salt. That's, um, that's his mate. So now, you know, it was really beginning to impact. People in the forest started getting, started getting really, you know, quite angry about, about what's happening. And uh, the real, the full you know, horror of what was happening at the Western Front was now beginning to sink home. Smith now 
was starting to get starting to get a bit moving to the right. He was now advoca advocating pro-war position. And again, we have this thing about empire. I mean, this whole idea of this empire and the interests of the British working class being tied up with the empire was one of the arguments you know, that, that was being used to, to, to justify the war. So in now, what we have is, is the coup out and uh, so in 1917 the government decided they were running out of men um, so they needed more men so they decided they were 40 they needed to recruit 40,000 miners and um, and then they immediately started negotiating with the miners Federation of Great Britain and they were very cleverly used this argument about uh, the mines, the men that joined the pit, went down the pits after August 1914. You know, they kept pushing this issue, kept push, pushing this issue, and it um, sadly gained some currency within the union. And again, uh, any absentee units or any troublemakers or anything like that could, could be recruited, could, could, could be conscripted. So this is uh, this is uh, our union agent here talking about uh, how he thought the miners might might be affected by this scheme. It says this quote at the bottom it says, "It would not bring in those skulking at home, whilst compulsion would rake them all in." The, this is a union official <laughs> talking about the young men he's meant to be representing. Compulsion would rake them all in. Right, and here are some of the young men that were raped in. Again, no chance of going to a military tribunal and saying you're a conscientious objector. Um, Colony recruiting court said, you've got to go. So he went and they were killed. Right, so obviously people are getting really, really angry, really, really angry about what's going on. Really angry with Rodinson, really ang angry with the deaths. You know, it, it, most families were being affected now. It's a small community, and um, uh, opposition has started to build up. Um, so. Uh, they linked up with some South Wales miners and some of the union activists. These are people who, are, who hold positions within the union. You know, quite, you know, people who were chairs of lodges. So, so organised a, a meeting at Speech House. The meeting was chaired by Richard Keir, who was a mate of David Organ, who I talked about earlier on. They were from um, Yorkley in, uh, yeah, in West Dean. And that, that, that area had always, had always been very troublesome for, for Rodinson. They'd always been in conflict, with, with, with going right back to the pre-war years. They worked in, a lot of these men worked in, in the steam coal pits. And they, you know, they thought they, 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 they needed this kind of the sort of agreements that, that the South Wales miners had. Um, and uh, to be honest, they left the union uh, because they just didn't, it, 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 some of them stayed in the union to fight, and some of them left. Some of them even made attempts to set up separate unions, but there was a lot of conflict terrain. And Rollinson actually closed down the Yorkley Lodge at one stage. So, uh, yeah, that's one. so um, at the meeting, they, they passed three motions. Because uh, Rollinson, at a national meeting, had agreed, uh, gone along and said for that, Represent, meant to be meant to be represent the forestry miners, and he committed the forestry miners to the Kumaid scheme without consulting, uh, without consulting them. So that was the first motion, uh, and, they, and then they're making it very clear that they didn't want to be conscripted. So that's the next motion, which was saying the Kumaid is, is just a, another word for conscription. And finally, we have this motion, 
which I think is, um, you know, is a good example of internationalism without even, without mentioning the empire. As in the views of the, the workers of all countries to negotiate an immediate and honourable peace. These people, Joseph Hodder and Charles Lees, were well respected members of, of the mining community. They lived in Sinderford, they were chairs of like, Sinderford Co op society, they were involved in lots of, of you know, friendly societies. And like that. These, these weren't just, they weren't just people on the, on the fringes, you know, they, these people were, were, at the heart, were, were, were at the heart of the Forestry Miners Association. What is the date of that meeting? Uh, August 1917. So this is his response. And this is where he made that quote about supply of coal. He stood up and he, 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 there was a meeting the following Sunday in his speech house uh, in the pouring rain. And they don't normally, it, the forest is still quite, there's a lot of, quite a religious area, so it was very, very unusual to have a mass meeting on a, on a Sunday, but they called the meeting after the, the, the first speech house meeting, and it was absolutely pouring down the rain, and people had to walk, you know, people had to walk, you know, 10 miles to get there, it was 2,000 miners there, massive row, massive, massive row. Yeah. Smith was accused of being an agent of the government, because he was now advocating, is now standing, showing the show of Robinson. And again, this, this started having an effect uh, nationally. And uh, obviously here, Rodinson um, got into an argument with some of the South Wales delegates at a national conference. And he accused them of sending troublemakers into the forest. Starting the flame. Yeah. But now, you know, Militancy was building up. We started getting getting um, industrial unrest. Uh, it's December 1917. Here we have a, 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 an unofficial dispute over over the, the sacking of a, a single worker. This uh, William Hoare. William Hoare also worked in South Wales, so he was obviously a militant at the pit. He worked in Orchard Colliery along with Richard Keir in David Organ, and Rowlandson never really had any kind of influence there, really. So that, you know they were kind of had their own, they had their own organisation, their own lodges, and um, you know so they, you know they were willing to strike just in the interests of to protect the interests of one, uh, of, of one man there. So you know I mean all this time I mean, things were getting quite nasty. Meetings, you know, huge arguments in, in, in all the lodge meetings, um, and then. Um, Decided, you know, they motions were put saying that, that, that there should be an election to, for a new agent, and, as, and also an election for the, for a new executive of, of, of the uh, Forestry Miners Association as well. So you can hit you. You can hear, see here that Rodinson was defeated, and the, obviously the issue the issue of conscription would would have been the main factors there in deciding. Where, where people vote. Um, the election of the new committee, here we have uh, Reuben James, if you can remember earlier on, was a supporter of, of, of William Smith when he challenged uh, um, um, Rowling's for the agency, you know, in the pre-war years. Reuben James was one of these people whose names keep popping up again and again. He's obviously militant. Again, he's from West Dean. Uh, Bream, which is near Yorkley, it was a Hewer, uh, I think it's Flower Mill Colliery, which is one of the other deep steam coal pits. And uh, David Organ uh, was uh, elected as Vice President. Smith and Perkins defeated by, by a large majority. Perkins was, was always a mate of, of Rodinson, and Smith has now got moved to, to had by this time moved to a pro war position. But, Clearly, you know, they, you know, they were defeated in the election. So then you had, so you had the, the takeover of the union, and then people started uh, organising politically. Um, again, people like Organ, 
a lot of the same people that are involved in the union were involved in the uh, Labour Party Representation Committee. So they started seeking a, 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 a Labour candidate. I mean, Rowland sort of actually, they did actually try to get a Labour candidate in, the, in, the, in an election uh, pre-war, um, but Rowlandson had stopped it and, 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 and refused to allow any funds to go from the union um, to fund a Labour candidate. So they couldn't afford to put a Labour candidate forward then. Um, so they had, they, had, they had to be previous attempts. But this is the first time that they, could, uh, they decided they could actually get a Labour candidate for the next general election. And here are some of the young men uh, in 1980. These are people that you know could be conscripted at any time. Um, um, sadly, Bert Brooks, who was a bloke there on the, on the, on the, on the left, he died. He, he went to Camp Connery, but he survived all this and but died in a roof fall in 1957. Again, having got through that whole process of recruiting 40,000, uh, uh, they, 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 they did a second uh, uh, coup out, and in this case, uh, uh, I think they, you know, they, they were running out of people who had um, entered the mines after 1914, so they decided to do it by ballot. Bishop Frodsham gladly leapt forward to, to, uh, to draw the ballot. But again, in this case, there was absolutely no right of appeal. They just they weren't. They tried, but they were given no right of appeal. So basically, they were elected by ballot, straight to the front. Hardly any training or anything sent straight to the front. Uh, and then we have have uh, having Rollinson having been defeated of the election for the new agents, and here we have. Uh, this bloke, this is one of those photos where I'm trying to work out who everyone is. Uh, but this is uh, uh, Booth. You all know who this is, don't we? Mm. Bevan? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oregon. And um, oh, the Labour. Quit his name. The Labour candidate, but oh, I just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, who was his name? <laughs> Wignall, that's it, Wignall, sorry, yeah. So yeah, so you've got Wignall, Bevan, Organ, Booth, but I don't know the end time. I need to find out really. Right, next one, so yeah, here we have James Wignall, the doctor of the Forest Sea Labour candidate for the next parliamentary seat. He was, uh, I think he was a member of the Dockers Union from Swansea, so he's working class background kind of a bit fudged it on the war issue. He said he wasn't a warmonger, but he said he wasn't a conscientious objector either. So, it's so things really started hopping, hotting up now as we get in, into the summer of 1918. Uh, this, is, this is again from uh, Brock Millman. He was talking, and it's an amazing statistic that they kept one and a half million troops in 1918, you know, right at the height of the German offensive, strategically placed at all the industrial centres around the country, but not too close, so they can fraternise with the industrial workers. I mean, I, I, you know, he, this is this book's written by a military historian um, who's not particularly. I don't, I'm not sure he's even left wing, but it's a you know, million and a half troops. Go to show how how, you know, how frightened they were of the, of the grow, growing unrest. Here's the quote. This is from a, a Canadian military historian. He's a member of the. He's actually a, uh, in the Canadian forces, but he's working as a military historian. Uh, next one. So strikes are just going up all over the place, but I think this, is, this one is just particularly um, <coughs> poignant, really, you know. Um, 
I mean, that's going to wind people up, isn't it? It's not very clever, really, to be honest. And, you know. um, again, William Orr is obviously causing problems at Norchard, so they try to get rid of him again. And then uh, William Booth, this time, threatens to close down the whole forest coal field. The government, the government are so frightened, they sent down the coal controller that there's a big mass meeting in Singapore. Where they're, where they're pleading with them not to shut the mines down. But they needed to keep the coal supplies come in. You had the Ameri Americans who were now joining the war, and they, 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 were, they, they were on the point of running out of coal. Because, it, because of the Americans joining them, they need more and more coal. So yeah, they gained it. And um, William Moore got his job back again. Uh, so the end of the war, really, now. Um, sort of back to. Uh, Back to work for most people. Um, we have, um, you know, pe people coming back in who would actually fought. Um, uh, so the miners were sent straight back down the pits as soon as they got back. They they were actually demobbed quite quickly. The miners, um, so they probably w weren't necessarily involved in some of the in uh, of the mi of the mutinies that were taking place in some of the camps. They needed them. They needed them back at back at the pits as quickly as possible. Um, then really just very very briefly what happened after I mean I expect you all know what happened after you know there was, there was a huge ballot for a national strike for the mines to be a uh, nationalised uh, government um, called the Sankey Commission there's an inquiry to look into whether the mines be nationalised um, of course the commission comes out with recommendation the mines be nationalised, but you know they, they just the government just dumped, dumped the recommendation, and, and the mines are handed, handed back to private owners, and their wages are a half, literally half. So this is kind of like how people felt afterwards. Not not exactly a, a, a land fit for heroes. Um, people like most of the you know the people like David Organ, uh, Reuben James, uh, Richard Keir, they you know they were they, they were were in, lead, in leading positions in the mines in, in the miners' union went, in, leading up to the 1926 general strike, and they you know they 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 had a support of a very good um, agent as well, so they were pretty solid you know through the strike. Um, obviously they lost. Um, yeah, people carried on dying, of course, in the pits. Um, uh, next one. So this is um, uh, Richard Keir's grandson, who I was actually talking to a couple of days ago, actually. He was, he was, he was reminding me about this story that he can remember um, from when he was a kid. Um, Obviously, people be very becoming very very politicised now. Next one, and this is from uh, uh, David Organ, who's David Organ, his grandson. Again, coincidentally, I was chatting to him this week as well, and uh, he's actually a businessman now, but he's very proud of his uh, of, of his uh, his the history of his, of his granddad. And if this was just this was after the 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 twenty six strike, or or those people that I mentioned, the the activists uh, were blacklisted. And a little bit of a forest dialect at the end there. Using a bit of German. <laughs> That's it. Any questions? Any questions? Or, you know, because yeah. they're, they're the two issues we're related to, we're covering, you know, you could say sort of issues issue of what was happening within the union, you know, sort of unwritten stories, really. Hidden, hidden, hidden histories, really, I think, you know. Well, I've got a question for, for both of you, but it's 
Kevin as well, really, because you put forward a good case study of how things changed, didn't they, really, through the, you know, the process of the way through those war years. And I just wondered how much Kevin thought that is reflected in other unions around the country. It's a general question, that kind of process. For Changed through the course of the war? Yeah, through the war. Is it, is it a reflection of other places, or is it just the exception? I think it was, um, well, you, you would know better than me, I think it was probably um, exceptional to the extent because the Forest of Dean Miners Association was one of the most radical unions of the 1920s um, and supporting, it. I mean, I don't know, you know, I hadn't really realised in terms of the older history, but it's, it stands out if you're looking at, at, a, at, a, um, at a national level because it's supporting these various causes and agitations. And I've, so I've come across the price of being miners quite a number of times in that. But I think it's happening in a lot of unions as well. I think, in a sense, you talk about something like the furnishing trades, like I was, or, or those people within the furnishing trades. In a sense, as you were describing, those sorts of views have become so much more prevalent by the latter part of the war, which was really was a minority position in, you know, in the earlier part of the war. So I don't know, you, you would know better than me, but I think... I, I don't think that's so untypical, but it's probably a stronger case than, than many of us. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think what's happening in a lot of the other miners, federated regions, yeah. you could see that whole process going on, you know. And, uh, South Wales, I think the whole executive got taken over by the end of the war by um, uh, some of the more militants from mm. there. And then they started feeding, and then they started people like Cook and people like that started feeding into the TUC, didn't they? You know, they, they were sort of like, you know, had an impact, you know, all right the way through. So, and I think that kind of yeah, was, was happening through the war, just gradually. You know, you wouldn't necessarily know, like little lodges, you know, you know you can change, the change of the, the personnel that were running the lodges and the secretaries, you know. So, yeah, I think. I don't know really how other you have because it because because the miners' unions were pretty democratic, you know, which is why I think p politically it would have been a mistake to start organising outside the union because um, you know they had the machinery there to actually effectively take it over, and uh, you know, and the shop stewards movement got got really completely hammered after the war, didn't they? Really, they just sort of disappeared. And, um, uh, but yeah, I'm sure you could look at, you know, you could do sort of micro histories of what's going on in particular areas. I'm not sure it would be a similar story. How did um, Winston Churchill's policy of trying to um, change uh, warships using from using coal to using oil affect the relative power balance uh, of miners and coal? I know in 1918 yes. the coal supplies were down to literally day. It was getting that tight. They were, they were absolutely terrified they were going to run out of coal. Yeah. Obviously they were looking at any way they can, yeah. you know. Because um, I didn't know yeah. relatively what time it became important, so I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think it probably, it certainly didn't affect yeah. the, the power that the miners apparently realised they had power, you know, they realised that, you know, they were willing to use it. So, um, particularly steam coal, because that was obviously an used in industry. Uh, yeah, another thing that came to mind was like we just, in the last few talks have happened over the last few, the last week, which have been about war resistance in Bristol and Stuff like that. And one of the interesting things well, that seems to come through is, is that those people who, who were holding these unpopular minority positions at the start of the war, whether they were ILP activists or whatever, they come out with, they don't get hammered after the war as a result. So what I'm saying is you get these differences. For example, you've got people who have been conscientious objectors, we've come across family history, people who come and told us about them, whose families were broken up, they couldn't get work, you know, blacklisted. And, Real difficulties as after the war, but similarly, there were people who stood for, you know, as Labour Party MPs and whatever, and they got elected 
even though they held this very unpopular position. And I, I just wonder, we might have been thinking, what we've been thinking about is, is thinking about whether, you know, because you held an unpopular position at the start of the war, and then by the end of the war that position was much more populist, that therefore you actually got some credit because you've been saying the right thing at the, well, arguably at the right time, but possibly the wrong time for yourself. Whereas other, do you, do you know what I mean? I think so. You said there that they that these people became political. You know, they became mm. elected. Some of them, even though they'd held unpopular positions mm. in the war. And I think that's really interesting. Whereas for ordinary activists, that wasn't always the case. Didn't have an easy ride after the war necessarily. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Mm. Do you know what you, what you think about that? Whether that holds in this case? I think. I mean, a, a case of somebody like that. You did like Ramsay MacDonald who what, didn't always take such a strong anti-war line as was sometimes suggested, but nevertheless, see when he was really handed by the press and so on during the war for the positions he took, and then by the time of, you know, he becomes Labour leader and then the first Prime Minister in the 20s, this is like an asset really, because he stood out, for, you know, for, not just because he stood out for values that he believed in, but there is a much wider acceptance that actually what, you know, by that time, what was it all about? So it's not a liability for him at all, he's like immensely popular. And actually I was thinking in terms of the, the question you were saying, actually when you were talking about Rawlinson, there was a there was a figure I should have mentioned, because I've given this presentation of the furnishing trade union, but there was a fourth official that I didn't mention, who was also a socialist, he was in the Social Democratic Federation, um, but, he's, but um, he was a Marxist of sorts, but his attitude was, he was actually quite like Rawlinson. Um, and he actually, he, I mean, he, was, he was a Bristolian by origin, his political base was in Leeds, but he used this language of compulsion. We as socialists owe it all to the state and therefore, um, he took this position, he was the NAFTA MP, and actually it, it sort of does fit in with, with what Ian was saying, because he, essentially broke with the union because they they repudiated him and he ended up with um, I think with Tillits and others he, and he, 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 he actually became there was some sort of um, dockers union of sorts that he became involved with but he, he effectively broke with the furnishing trades and I think it sort of did for his political base he ceased to become the, the, the actor MP and so on so so there were those elements also within the furnishing trades, and I think there was a shifting over the course of the war by which they could, in some cases, be, you know, marginalised to that extent. Yeah, I mean, what happened to it? Stanton, I mean, they just, they just disappeared off yeah. the face of the map, didn't they, after the war, from what, from what I understand? I mean, did they have any the, political careers or anything? Till it, it, till it did, but, he, but till it was more like, you know, he, would, he just became this... Arguably, establishment figure really. I mean, he made comments to me about, you know, he was, he was still making statements and getting in the press in the twenties and thirties, but he wasn't. I don't think he had much power. Anymore. But still, it was like a total maverick because he'd taken this very chauvinist position, but he was on, not as a, as a key figure on it. But he went on that delegation to Soviet Russia, and he wrote a pamphlet about my impressions of Russia. Well, you yeah. know, so that. Um, and yet, at the same time, two or three years later, he's trying to get Lord Beaver book to give him a pension and the rest well, of it. So he money off the Tories. Exactly, over, right? exactly. So he was, just, but so he was just a one-off in some yeah. way. You know. yeah. Rolison got a, uh, an MBE and a, and a massive payoff check. Actually, oh, he, did, he got a huge amount. Didn't he? Well, it was about seven hundred quid, which is a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. He's all of that. Was you know, in nineteen eighteen, before the end of the war. What was the average? What was the weekly wage then? Was it about? Well, if yours could get five shillings a day in the beginning of the war, that went up, kind of more or less double. What's that, about three, two, three quid? Five shillings. So they worked six in six, six days, days, weren't they? So six, five. Two and a half Yeah. I mean, it did go up a lot. Still it's didn't, it didn't go up. It, it didn't go up. It went up. If you look at the figures, I mean, it went up. You know, you've got like miners' wages, inflation, and then you've got coal miners' profits. It's whacking really high up, you know. Actually. So what's that? That's like there a bit, you know, like that's like um, what's that then? That's about ten years' wages, or so. Yeah. Got, yeah. 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 Of an ordinary miner's wage. Yeah. 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 Sort of money, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He ended up on the Westbury board of guardians, and 
and uh, he f refused to give relief to striking miners families in 1926. <laughs> Basically, he's a villain, isn't he? He's, a, he's, a, he's, not, he's not my favourite person. <laughs> <laughs>